I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today, we have the second meeting of the Math for Wisdom Sociology Study Group, and uh, it's uh, co-led by Aslam Kakar of Rutgers University. Uh, he's the sociologist uh, among us, and so today he will present uh, his personal methodology as a sociologist, and then uh, we'll have a discussion introducing uh, the people who have joined us today and searching for topics that we could pursue in sociology. Welcome. Thank you, Asla. Thank you so much, um, Andreas. Uh, you know, this is uh, the, the moment where I feel like um, I'm being taken seriously because people are uh, <laughs> giving me the time and ears to listen to what I have to say. Um, although I should start by saying that I, I have a, I'm getting my PhD in global affairs. I'll defend at the end of March. So um, my degree is in interdisciplinary. Uh, its focus is interdisciplinary, but I have trained myself uh, along the way as a sociologist and my advisor is a sociologist. My focus uh, is on social movements uh, using comparative historical sociology, but I'm personally very interested in sociological questions. So let me start by um, defining what uh, sociology is. Um, I think uh, uh, I will be reading, but also hoping to be making uh, eye contact and <laughs> to be interactive. Um, so, so simply put, uh, sociology, as we know, is the study of social structures and social institutions and sociological work is often divided into such topics as the class structure of modern societies, the family, crime, and deviance, religion, and, and so on. Um, I'm sure um, you have um, heard or seen books, articles, and chapters titled as the sociology of religion, the sociology of suicide, sociology of politics. I was just going through the list of books. There was the sociology of childhood. So sociology um, covers um, so much in, in the social life. Um, and, and while doing so, so I may be jumping between theory and methodology in my presentation, so um, I hope you uh, will bear with me. Um, I think it is also important to probably know what, what does, where does the term sociology come from? Um, it is attributed to Auguste de Comte, um, a French philosopher, um, 1798 to 1857. Um, and one of the leading classical sociological theorists. Um, the term appeared in print in 1837 for the first time in his, in the fourth volume of Kant's fam famous book called Course on Positive Philosophy, um, published in Paris um, in seven volumes in the years stretching from 1830 to 1842. Um, Comte is, or Comte is often regarded as one of the founding figures of sociology and positivism, a philosophical approach that emphasizes empirical observation and the scientific body of social phenomena. Um, now, probably it would be interesting also to kind of unpack the word sociology. What is it made of? So it is, um, it has its roots in Latin and Greek, uh, the word sociology is derived from a combination of two components. Socio, uh, this prefix comes from the Latin word socius, which means com companion or associate. And the suffix logi or logi comes from the Greek word logos, which means study or science. So when you combine, you put the two together, you get sociology, which literally means the study or science of companionship, association, or society. Um, so, um, you know, I can go on and, and talk more about Kant in his philosophical or his sociological vision, but I, uh, it's not about Kant. So I will um, go on to introduce my own approach uh, as a sociologist. Um, so I, I want to 
also, before I do that, I want to spend a little bit of maybe a minute or two on the grammar of sociology. Andreas, uh, I've never heard of like this phrase, grammar of sociology, and I'm very pleased that Andreas introduced me to it. And I've been thinking about it. What is grammar of sociology? Right. So, I mean, I kind of understand it. Right. But I was also like, let me unpack this also a little bit. Like, what do we mean by it? And Andreas, at the end, you can also tell me if you agree or you disagree but this is what i mean what this is what i understand by the grammar of sociology right um i think for me it's the concepts and definitions in theories ontologies epistemologies models and methodologies we used to understand any particular social phenomenon right so probably that's what we mean by the grammar of sociology right so grammar literally is also tools to construct a language, but here it's the concepts, theories, definitions, you know, and methodologies um, in sociology. Uh, so, so in this sense, for me, the fundamental question to understand any phenomenon in the social world is where should one begin? Um, I mean, this is, again, I am, I'm a young uh, scholar and uh, I could be wrong. I'm very... Um, I don't know if I should say this, but it should be obvious that I'm humble in my um, open and doubtful about how um, I understand things. So, so for me, the, the question is, where do we begin, right? In other words, what ontological position should one operate from? Um, and, and I think it is obviously one's ontology, which is, for me, the questions pertaining to the nature of reality that sets the direction of their epistemology, um, which is how do we know that something is the case? Like, what is the method that we use to understand a phenomenon in the social world? Yeah, in this case, because we are uh, talking about sociology, which is about society and human beings and human relationships. So many people, especially religious people, I mean, no offense, but this is my understanding because of my experience, um, have a tendency to attribute the development of social structures, institutions, and everyday occurrences to some sort of hidden power, hidden causes. Uh, I say this because as a Muslim, I'm not a Muslim anymore. I uh, I know this is going public, but that's fine. I, I grew up as a Muslim in an Islamic society um, where the, the hidden cause uh, was God. Uh, in, for example, in Hinduism or Allah, in Hinduism it's Bhagwan, and in other religions you can, you know, talk about, um, you can give it any name. So, born and raised in an Islamic society, I witnessed for decades people's strong belief in the completedness of understanding or knowledge of life provided by the holy book, the Quran. The book is believed to be the complete and final word of God that answers or that has answers to all questions. Um, there are also in, in the Islamic traditions verses and from the Quran and prophetic sayings uh, in society that people talk about, such as seeking knowledge is compulsory upon every man and woman. And then there is a saying by the prophet reported that go to China if you have to, to seek knowledge. I don't know why he said China, but probably um, 1450 years ago, probably there was something going on, but I, I'm not a historian, so I can't uh, tell you why China. But but this is all great, right? Like, okay, it's compulsory, but, but the problem still is that questioning the Quran is blasphemous, for example, right? The belief in the finiteness or finishedness as uh, the Brazilian educator and philosopher Paulo Freire would say, the finishedness of understanding provided by the Quran is unshakable. Like, it's like, okay, I mean, of course, this is not to say that there are, I'm from the same society, I grew up in that society. So there are, of course, individuals uh, who, you know, question who, you know, but, but the problem is that there is also the environment in which they reside. So it's very hard to question certain things. For example, in, in Pakistan, blasphemy is punishable by death. So there you go. Um, now, um, what this does is that it sets the stage for an extremely problematic and faulty ontological and epistemological framework for understanding. 
Such an approach leaves, I, in my understanding, little to no space for doubt, for questions while generating plentiful certitude. So people just know, you know, they just know it because they went to the mosque and the imam talked about the book and the book has all the answers. The book is in Arabic. They don't understand a word, maybe a few words here and there, but that was the problem. And for me, you know, growing up uh, while in, you know, pursuing my studies, these questions have come up. My problem with this framework is that it is dangerous, it's boring, it's useless. Because for me, I don't believe in the finishedness of understanding of life. For me, as, as again, um, Freire said, Paolo Freire, that any, any understanding of the social phenomenon or pretty much everything in life is an unfinished understanding which requires continuous inquiry and research. So it's, it's, it's just, uh, I think when it's, when we know, okay, we're done. I mean, what's left. So for me, it's like, okay, we don't know. We, we have to, um, continue the search. My approach is a secular approach, not bound to a particular geography, race, nationality, or religion. I, I also think knowledge of the social world, socioeconomic, political, or moral judgments, unlike empirical judgments, uh, are more subjective, relative, than absolute or objective. So two kinds of judgments, moral judgments and empirical judgments, or social, political, economic judgments. For me, the door to understanding what sociologists are interested in, in investigating is human beings or are human beings themselves. Uh, Andreas, you mentioned this, you know, I think put in different words because I cannot recall the exact word that it's through us, through our own understanding, through our own discovery that we can approach uh, understanding the greater social world, right? So that is how I see it. But of course, individual is just one element. As I will explain later what I what else is out there that we could use to understand um, the social reality, whatever that means, reality. Here, uh, when I say I have a secular approach, and I would like to briefly also discuss Edward Said, uh, who was an American, uh, Arab, especially Palestinian, American Palestinian intellectual, in the 20th century. Um, I don't know if he also went to Princeton, um, but uh, he uh, is an intellectual giant. He made a distinction between two terms, origin and beginning. Uh, in his book, Beginnings, Intention and Method, um, distinguishing between origin, which is per se a divine, mythical and uh, a privileged sort of uh, position and beginning, which is a secular and humanely, humanly produced uh, Said traces the ramifications and diverse understandings of the concept of beginning throughout history, right? So, so what, in other words, when we talk about origin, we are essentially talking about the divine nature of life, questions such as who are we, where do we come from, I think these are also metaphysical questions, right, which philosophers, thinkers have dealt with for centuries, for millennia. Um, but I think, well, I don't, I mean, we don't know the answer, right? There are theories. But um, but for say, the beginning is concerned with the intentionality of human beings, right? So origin is the divine sort of nature of life, you know, and beginning is is that what we have, what we see is made, created as a result of the intention and action of human beings. So uh, he says that a beginning is a first step in the intentional production of meaning and the production of difference from pre-existing traditions. And then it authorizes subsequent texts. It both enables them and limits what is acceptable. Uh, but this Said was not the first one who did this. This Said was influenced by the uh, 17th century uh, um, Italian theologian, philosopher, uh, and uh, scholar, uh, 
uh, Gian Batista Vico, uh, who um, who is known for his influential contributions to the philosophy of history, epistemology, and the study of human society and culture. So his most significant work, Sainza um, Nuwa, New Science, published in 1725, uh, it outlines this philosophy. So there is more, but what, the one thing that I would like to talk about from Wiko is, um, uh, is, is his notion of verum factum principle, which we co-introduced um, um, and, and he meant by it the true he said he meant that the true is the made uh, right so the principle emphasizes that human beings can understand and know what they have created or made but they may struggle to comprehend things that are not of human origin right so but Saeed I think Rico kind of made it easy for Saeed uh, to uh, not really dig into the question of um, the origins of life and um, with that uh, he also wrote about Islam and Quran so Said was you know he kind of strategically avoided getting into understanding Quran and taking a different route which uh, his uh, mm, um, and then I'll just very quickly, his uh, very close friend, confidant and lover, uh, a Lebanese French novelist, uh, um, Ed, uh, what was her name? Dominique, oh, Dominique Ede. Uh, she wrote a book about Said. It's called uh, Said is Thoughts in a Novel. So she talks about how Said, you know, avoided into this um, getting into the understanding of this whole Quran because, I mean, life is too short. You got to identify what how much time you have for what so he didn't really so so say again the question is that the, the, the point is that say for say what was important was the beginning that the intentionality of human beings and that what we have so i think the reason i'm mentioning this this for me it's also again growing up in a society where um you know the taliban killed for example six seventy thousand pakistanis in the past 20 years uh just so that i also make this concrete and um, and and relevant, um, so so people uh, a lot of the time people will just say, oh, it's you know they would just brush these things aside. I mean, out of helplessness, I think there is also a tendency in human beings to say, oh, you know, God will do this, um, and um, when they when they are helpless. But but the problem for me is that well, the you know these guys came from somewhere. God. You know, I don't believe in God sending these guys. You know, this is this is a creation of human intention and and action. Like the state created this group, and this it it there is there is a context, there is a historical context to this. So we have to understand, like using our 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 creativity, our our capacity with reason, and not just say that all oh, this was to happen, or like oh we had to die, somebody had to die in a suicide blast because he was on the run. No, I mean, I get it. There is a part of that. But so um, uh, I uh, uh, hope I'm not digressing from from this. Um, and here I will also link this, the 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 technical creativity, the, the capacity for reason to Kant's uh, very famous essay, What is Enlightenment, in which he says that it is the escape from self-incurred tutelage the escape of human beings from self-anchored tutelage. When tutelage, it defines as one's inability to use their own understanding without the direction of others. So if you are able to use your own reasoning, uh, you're enlightened. But if you rely on, you know, textbooks or a holy book or some authority or some tradition or some hidden cause, then you're not very enlightened. So for me, I think as a sociologist, as a as a scholar, as a as a social scientist, I think it is important to be enlightened in the Kantian sense. And so, <clears throat> um, I, I I if you allow me very briefly, I I would like to also I I, I told Andreas about this book, the study of man by Michael Poliani, and great book. One day, hopefully, we can talk in detail about this. So Michael Poliani, for example, says that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and let me take a step back and, and ask the question that I have. Is human being or individual the only element component for understanding 
the social world. For me, it is the most important element, but um, of course, it is not the only element. Why is it the most important? Because as Michael Pogliani says, man's capacity to think is his most out outstanding attribute. Whoever speaks of man will therefore have to speak at some stage of human knowledge. This is a troublesome prospect, for the task seems to be without end. As soon as we had completed one such study, our subject matter would have been extended by this very achievement. We should have now to study the study that we had just completed, since it too would be a work of man. And so we should have to go on reflecting again on our last reflections in an endless and futile endeavor to comprise completely the works of man. So I think it's a very fascinating um, paragraph from, from the book. Um, well, the human beings, as I said, are the most important, but there are others. And here I will use uh, some slides, if you don't mind, uh, Please. Uh, Andres. Uh, Please. Uh, so the slide. Thank you. Um, and um, where is it? Share screen. Okay, so um, as you can see, I'm also trying to um, be able to read the text that I have. And okay, it's maybe it's a bit that the, this. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Okay. So the, the you know some of these are of course uh, you know very basic. Uh, I would skip the, the theory part and I would come to the, so the, the individual. When I talk about the individual, what do I mean by the individual? Um, the, okay, so the individual um, is, as you can see, uh, the definition that it's um, basic concept. It's self-directed um, beings with rationality, uh, but who are socially and emotionally attached to members of their family, neighborhood, peer group, and so on, right? Now, two, there are two characteristics. Um, this is like very basic, but I like to break this down because when we think about the individual, what do we mean by the individual? So two individual as embodied objects, right? So we are, you know, we are like, objects, physical objects, we walk, we have uh, abilities, disabilities, we are things we can do, there are things we can't do, but they were also subjects, right? So that's what I mean by the individual. And there is a, uh, there is this theory called methodological individualism, which um, emphasizes the, 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 the fact that individuals are the, if we understand the individual, we understand society. So individual, it is through individuals that we um, can um, understand, um, you know, social phenomena. Um, methodological individualists, their argument is based on the rational choice theory, which the, the idea that individuals are rational beings and use their rationality um, to make decisions. Hence, we can understand what happens in the social world if we can just understand the reasoning and motivation of human beings behind what they do, right? So that is the RCT, rational choice theory. Uh, probably it's also linked to Andreas to your economic, uh, the, the economic side of your argument, right? That the motivation and the rational decision. 
But uh, realists, uh, which is the position that uh, the book uh, Social Theory, a toolkit, um, that they take, they take issue with this position. They claim that although individuals are a necessary component for social explanation, they are not sufficient. Uh, we need to consider the role of other elements. So what are these other um, elements? These other elements are nature, action, structure, social structure, and culture. So I'll go one by one and briefly define what they mean and what what are their functions and what are their strengths and what are their limitations in terms of um, explaining the social uh, phenomenon. Um, so we can, uh, realists argue that we can consider nature as a realm of material existence, which is self-subsistent. That is not dependent on human agency. In this sense, it is external to humans, operating according to its own processes and laws. And I think we kind of understand, you know, that yes, nature is this realm of material existence, which is independent of human beings, but it is not that simple. I think it is more complicated than that. We can think of nature as something separate from humans, but also something that humans are part of, right? Now, uh, now, the important point here is also the interaction between nature and culture, uh, nature and humans or individual. As I just mentioned, it is difficult to keep the individual and the nature apart. On the one hand, nature is an independent entity, but on the other hand, humans are also part of nature. One kind of animal among others, which can be said to have their own species, species characteristics. So two things to consider, nature embodied in humans themselves and how nature as an environment within which humans conduct their lives might influence social outcomes. This is from the book that Andres uh, and I have read, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> social theory, a basic toolkit. So a lot of this is, the second part of my presentation is based on, because I've really, I think I, I have enjoyed reading this book and this is also a summary with some of my critique uh, or less critique uh, uh, of the book. Um, so um, we know that individuals might not be able to mediate the extremities of nature, such as extreme weather conditions, but over the course of millennia of human history, where on the one hand, nature has conditioned the behavior of humans, humans have also been able to mediate the force of nature, right? Uh, bridges, dams, means of transportation through the use of rationality and technical creativity individuals have been able to survive some of the harshest conditions of nature. Now, on the next slide, I want to talk about culture. So far, we have discussed the role of two concepts, right? Individuals in nature and social explanation. We have established that individuals and nature are, albeit necessary, but not sufficient for explaining social Phenomena. And I'll explain, uh, I think, at the end, what sufficient and necessary. I mean, these are very simple ideas. Hopefully, I'm not also over explaining, but uh, probably this is also, you know, I, I talk to my students, they are young, so a lot of this probably are, is also coming from my audience. Um, why? Because people, so I said, we have established that individuals and cult in nature are albeit necessary, but not sufficient. Why are they not sufficient? Because people are not just rational problem solvers. And I, we know that, you know, I sometimes I leave, I leave my, my uh, door closed and then I return like at least sometimes, some days, five times. I'm like, okay, did I, did I close my door? Like, yeah, you did. No, maybe you didn't do it. So we're not rational beings, you know, we just we also believe in other sort of we are mythic beings too, in some sense. So um human mediation of nature or the environment is not simply a matter of technical calculation and reaching one correct conclusion. There are different kinds of knowledge besides technical know-how. And what do we mean by this? What is that kind of knowledge? Meaning involves cold reason of logic, but also the hot influence of emotion. Uh, 
as I just mentioned, since nature and individuals are not sufficient elements, there are two alternatives to rationalization as ways of deciding about uh, the acceptability of ideas favored by supporters of tradition, tests of collective identity, this is what we believe, tests of authority, whatever the parent, teacher, priest, expert says. This is where culture comes in. What is culture? It is one of the fuzziest concepts as we know to define, but let's take a stab at it. It has three possible meanings here. Social status and respectability by persons with- Oh, that's the previous slide. Oh, that's this? Yes. Uh, oh yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. So, of course, social status and respectability by persons with a certain education who believe they possess rare powers of critical judgment about the finer and higher spheres of achievement. Uh, this is cultural capital. This meaning associates culture with art, refinement, cultivation, etc. Second, it may be taken to mean respectability for subordinated or threatened traditions, communities, and practices in order to improve their position in the competition for resources. And third, it is also taken to mean a whole way of life. It is a contemporary, in a contemporary sense, culture also has political significance. Um, and so we can add um, ideas, norms, beliefs, values, and practices to culture. What role does culture play? Uh, culture, uh, as you can see in this diagram, um, uh, it constrains or enables action. And so, I mean, I have seen this firsthand. Uh, I, I don't mean to name and shame uh, um, my culture, but it's as as a sociologist, I understand uh, the people who were practicing it probably had very little uh, leverage over transforming it, but culture, I've, I've, I've felt it. I mean, we have all felt it, right? When you go against it, you feel the force of it. So it's whether it is falling in love when your family doesn't approve of it, or whether it is questioning God when it's looked down upon, or whether it's questioning other things. So it's culture is, is a force uh, of its own. So it, it either constrains or it enables action. And sociologists also talk about tight culture and loose culture. So in loose cultures, like in Western cultures, there is room for creativity. Uh, you know, you can um, write a novel about something that, you know, is, you know, you can question God, you can question whatever, you know, but, but in tight cultures, that's going to be very risky and pricey. To, to do that kind of activity, right? So like the liberty that you have in loose cultures, you don't in tight cultures. So culture in that sense, it either enables or it constrains action. Um, and we, we will look at action in a second. And so culture also conditions social structure, which we'll, we will look at uh, soon um, also. Constraints or enables means culture either facilitates or collection or discourages it. And conditions means it shapes it in, in some ways, not controls it. So it's not, there is still room for creativity. As I say, condition means it creates an environment of possibilities or impossibilities in which social structures develop, uh, which we, when we see conditioning or condition, we mean influence, not necessarily total control. Or determination. Um, action, the, the discussions of nature and culture and their place in social explanations suggested that they should be thought of as conditions of action. Condition Conditioning is a relatively open concept of constraint, which helps to explain regularity, patterning, and typicality, but leaves room for the possibility of novelty innovation and variation from the typical. As used here, conditioning doesn't mean determining, as I said before, the force of the relative autonomy of natural and cultural conditions is mediated by how people interact with them. So we have to think about the properties, the action 
involved in this mediation. It is a necessity to think of these three concepts uh, as a set. It is not really possible to do social explanation without using all three. In particular, it is not possible to talk about conditioning without talking about what mediates the condition, that is action. Uh, in the book, it is defined as a conduct, as you can see on the slide, a conduct directed by the intentions of a voluntary, voluntary agent. For there to be action, there have to be who have motives and purposes. Action is done by actors, those capable of initiating action, rather than simply being forced to behave in, in some way. Um, like yes, so so most importantly, action is conditioned by a historical process. I think this is again very important. Here you can see in the chart how past actions influence the present, which through mediation of creative action reproduce or transform the conditions of future action. Right? Fascinating, it isn't it? So past as it's, it's again in the book. So I've taken this from the book. Um, if you want me to leave this for a few seconds, I can. Um, and or as I can move on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, so in this slide, you can see the, the summary uh, of the relative autonomy of action, right? So um, it's a bit small, but I can try to. It's the properties of action, they are uh, voluntary intentional agents making choices, rationality plus information, interpretation, evaluation, judgment, common sense. So it's the relative autonomy. The whole point is that action, there is that room for, for action. Um, I mean, we have seen this in protest movements. So I, I study social movements in authority under uh, non-democracies in Pakistan and Turkey. So it's fascinating to see individuals using their agency against all odds, you know, against repressive authority and states, and, but they still are able to organize. We've, we've seen it in the BLM, we have seen it in many, many other places. So it's, uh, I mean, we've seen it with, with the Ukrainians, one can say, right? Um, so, um, and we, we see this in our everyday lives. Um, um, now, limits of action, of course, uh, you know, we need an analysis of history to understand action. Action is not an entirely autonomous and self-producing entity and uh, so on and so forth. And here I would like to um, just take note of what Marx said. Marx said, although men make history, they do not do under conditions of their own choosing and they cannot evade the influence of the past. So action is not entirely autonomous, of course, as we know. Um, then there is social structure. So what social structure, we now come to our final concept of social structure. I've taken 45 minutes, very quickly, uh, this will be done. Um, uh, my apologies if I bored you um, with, with these slides and these ideas. Oh, very but, good, everything is fine, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we now come to um, our final concept of social structure, which should be as fundamental a part of any social Leninists or a sociologist toolkit as culture and action. Although uh, particularly used by sociologists, anybody interested in explaining social life can benefit from learning how to use it. Indeed, we have already found ourselves referring to social structure to fill out a, the explanation of patterns and regularities when some of the other concepts have reached their limits. Earlier, for example, we criticized uh, we didn't. I didn't talk about this, um, but um, I'll, I'll, uh, um, the the context for this paragraph is that you know the uh, why some kids um, succeed um, at tests for SAT or GRE or these others and others don't. So what is it? Is it because these kids are uh, unintelligent naturally, or because they have the, they don't have access to resources, right? To uh, capital, cultural capital, or 
educational capital. So that was the context. So here I say that, I mean, the explanation is very important. If you tell these kids, it's not that you are unintelligent. It is because you didn't have exposure to a certain, uh, you know, uh, way of um, like a, a good education um, system. Um, so, so that is the context. And so here I say earlier, for example, we criticize those who believed that patterns of educational success and failure could be explained simply by referring to the properties of individuals, right? Because individuals are smart or they're not smart. Um, as Smith said, that it is not um, a person's intellect, Adam Smith said, that it is not a person's intellect that determines their social position. It is their social position that determines their intellect. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but you know, I think it's kind of true. I think the son of a professor is more likely to become a professor, not necessarily, but uh, but if you know, it takes a lot more harder work to move up the social ladder. But uh, but that's the idea. So ignoring the fact that they are already located in a class structure of differentiated of differential access to educational resources, the children in the educational system are not isolated individuals, but start out in life located or positioned within distributional orders. They are distinguished by differences of age, sex, region, class, housing, health, ethnic classification, language, and religion, for example. All these are factors we might think consequential for various kinds of educational outcome and worth researching. Um, how each child is positioned to engage in the education system affects how they relate to it and vice versa. Children do not choose their position at the start. It is their legacy for good or ill. We can define, and then this is, I will give a quick example before I move on. And, and I think I'll finish in like two, three minutes. When I was in my, uh, in sixth grade in a tiny village in Pakistan, um, there were 65 students with me. When I was in 10th grade, there were 13 students. I've imagined, the percentage, the ratio of dropout. A lot of these kids, so it's like 13 and almost um, how many? 52 students dropped out in, in five years, right? And then not to mention from 13, I made it to the US, but that's like one in a million, in millions. It became, it becomes a story. It's like, oh, but that, you know, it's, it's, just um, uh, there are other factors that really, um, you know, is, are at play as to why these 52 students dropped out, you know, I mean, poverty, extreme poverty. Some of them became mechanics. Some of them became laborers. Some of them became gardeners. Some of them became wage earners, you know. So, so yeah, um, that's probably is, is, uh, an example um, related to what I just said. So um, structures are a set of interrelated social positions, each one of which is defined and constituted by the relations it has with other positions. If you look at the chart um, here, um, you will see uh, what social structure does. It conditions culture and constrains or enables action. Let's suppose the structure and institutions of a country are corrupt. They will create environment in which a corrupt culture will develop, for instance, a culture of corruption. Uh, but you have to understand that in the end, you have to, or we have to account for the role of each in the set of three, action, social structure, and culture. Um, and then uh, what I will do is, uh, yeah, I'll just move on and... Uh, yeah, I think uh, here, strength and limitations, um, the table, I don't know if this um, is good at explaining what I'm trying to say, that the, these are a necessary but not sufficient, each of these uh, components. Um, and then what I mean by necessity is a concept necessary when it is inevitable to the explanation of a social phenomenon. But being necessary does not mean it alone can explain the reason right, why things are the way they are. And then no single concept is sufficient, although it is necessary. Um, and um, yeah, I think this really is the end of my um, presentation. I hope 
it was worth your time and thank you so much for attending for listening to me for giving me the time i'm very um pleased very much honored thank you so much thank you andres and thank you to all of you thank you aslam we can all uh un we can all unmute ourselves and applaud and uh, so this gives us a sense of uh, how you proceed with methodology. Uh, that You mentioned this book, uh, which I have now. It's actually very inexpensive, uh, Social Theory, a Basic Toolkit. Uh, and so I read the first chapter on individual, the first couple, then we'll be proceeding. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for discussion. Um, basically, any comments you ha might have about Aslam's presentation, about this uh, frame, this overall framework of the different, uh, you know, uh, concepts or angles, and then also to talk about uh, what you might, uh, each of you might uh, find uh, meaningful uh, to analyze from a sociological point of view, and also please feel free to introduce yourself because I'm. I, just so that Aslam knows uh, who you are and something about you. Thank you. Yeah, so my name's Ryan, and I'm kind of a writer. I don't really have a specialty yet, but uh, I come from a poor background myself, and it's very cool that you were able to make it here to America I'm really interested in the sociology of addiction and basically the sociology of psychiatric illnesses. And uh, the same sorts of, of complex circumstances that are driving people to drop out are driving people towards drugs and other negative habits as well. Thank you and so much. I, that's, yeah. Where where um, where is home, Ryan? I'm from Oregon. You're from Oregon, Southern Oregon. Okay, okay. Good to meet you. It's good to meet you too. Here's a handshake. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for your presentation, Aslan. Of course. I enjoyed uh, listening to you, and you're very fluent and uh, methodical. I have no uh, no formal education in sociology. Uh, I'm Anders' father, by the way. And uh, it's just very interesting. Uh, uh, it's a vast subject and uh, can be, well, but you know, you, you uh, made a methodical presentation, a lot to think about. And uh, yeah, you can spend a lifetime delving into it. I'm sure you will. Yeah. So good yeah. luck. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, patience, for listening, and for for being here. I guess I'll I'll jump in. <clears throat> this is Kirby from Portland, Oregon. I met Ryan not so long ago when Andreas was here. Ryan came up and visited on the bus. It's a four hour trip each way. So it's not like we're neighbors exactly. Anyway, my question is, I'm trying to put it into words even as I'm speaking. Um, this academic point of view tends to try to instill the values of being somewhat removed and aloof so that we can sort of be outside culture so that we can see it better and talk more about all how, you know, it's more of a, a global framework so that we can study all these individual cultures. But I put myself in the position, say, oh, by the way, my daughter, Tara, she went to Earlham College, which is in the middle of the country. And I remember visiting and books by Edward Said were very important in the curriculum there. They were reading those, the one on Occident, Orientalism, et cetera. That college also has ties to Turkey. I also, by the way, have been working for a Turkish company recently. I never see my bosses, but they're all somewhere in Turkey. <laughs> uh, data science and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's a small world, I guess. I, I'll, I'll encapsulate those remarks under the heading of 
small world, but here's my question. Yeah. I want, let's say, to affect social change. Do you foresee a could could sociology usefully, or would this be a bad move? Would it be a good idea for like sociology to advertise itself, to hold itself out as if you want to affect social change in whatever walk of life? It doesn't necessarily mean political party. It might be just the art of persuasion, maybe advertising, maybe marketing, maybe just being an influencer. Everybody wants to be a YouTuber these days and be an influencer in some way, have weight in a community where you have influence. People take you seriously. Might I go to college and take sociology because that's what I want to learn about. I want to study how to be effective and how to have my how to collaborate also because i think when we talk about individual versus larger constructs one way to look at it is effectiveness what can i do as just an individual is different than if i have the tools to recruit and have more individuals somehow on the same page or roughly on the same page these kinds of questions so how do i effectively collaborate how do i build a team do you think that sociology, even if it doesn't today, do you think that the toolkits and the concepts that you encounter in sociology could become the basis for training in social mobilization of one kind or another? And I think just to finish, like you mentioned, Paolo Fieri, Fieri, I have trouble saying his name. He was just right. becoming really big when I was an undergrad at Princeton, by the way, which was way back in the 1970s. I'm class of 1980. But we would get together or I would lurk in on little groups in the coffee shops where they would talk about Paolo Fieri with a lot of respect and so forth. And I would take that as typical of using maybe we could call it sociology to heighten the awareness and consciousness of others and i think that's where my question might go is in the direction of building fluency among people like you teach sociology as a discipline to help people build their fluency about their context and their thereby gain power over it and make change what do you think Fascinating uh, question. Um, I'll try to um, answer in, in the best way I understand. And I think uh, you're right that uh, sociology, um, I mean, I'm not saying that you made that assertion, but the observation that can it be um, a study of, um, you know, uh, ways of things in terms of influencing society. Um, I, I do think it does. I think, for example, my research is on social movements. So I study social movements in Pakistan and of the Pashtuns and comparing it to the Kurds in Turkey. And so these are, of course, very, these are like bigger macro uh, level uh, questions. And um, I think sociology does help us in understanding why, um, for example, conflict starts in the first place and how do you understand um, the factors behind a conflict and how do individuals then respond. Uh, so that would be, you know, historical sociology. What is What are the historical factors? So using things like period effects and you know, path dependency. I mean, these methods are used in other, in political science and history and in other uh, disciplines also. So so I think to to to, um, to, to cut it, to, to put it sh in short terms, yes, I think sociology does um, help in understanding us, in understanding the problems and what individuals can and, and, and should do. But I think it also then depends on the, position that one takes. So for example, I am not in, uh, in, in, I don't really am, am in the business of prescription as to how you should go about things. So for example, even in the social movement uh, question, I really try to explain what, what is going on here. Why are some people taking up guns against the state and others are engaging in civil resistance? Like what are the factors? What are the explanations? for these kinds of um, strategies. And in doing so, you also 
get into, of course, the mind of the individual, like what are the individual motivations, the psychological sort of explanations, right? The political explanation, the religious explanation, um, you know, for why, what motivates individuals to engage. So, for example, you have two groups uh, oppressed in two different states under very similar political, institutional, historical structures, but one responds, the other doesn't respond. Like the other doesn't resist. Like why do some resist, others don't resist? So my question in the case of Kurds and Pashtuns is, why did the Kurds take up guns against the state in 1980 and Pashtuns have not taken up guns against the state? So, and that then involves, I think, the understanding of the historical conditions, you know, the factors. So uh, I, ho I hope the answer uh, makes sense. So that's my understanding. I'd like, um, I, oh, my father got a chance to say something. Is that correct or not? Uh, I, I stepped out for a minute. And what was, uh, I wanted to ask my father, is there something that you would like to see uh, studied in uh, sociology or that you find interesting or meaningful? Well, how is how's sociology helping or can help in resolving conflicts. I mean, we have so many conflicts. Oh, Andreas, you said your father? Uh... This is my father, Edmundas Kulikas, because he's in Lithuania, in the capital city, Vilnius, and I'm in the countryside, so. Wow, I'm I didn't here. know, I'm sorry. Yes, so I'm glad Good to introduce meet you. Thank yes. you. Good to meet you. So Me it's too. very fun that he is here. And so um, I've written down, um, just to summarize maybe, so my father uh, asked, how can sociology help resolve conflict? Uh, I personally would also like to see that happen. We're, of course, uh, very uh, concerned about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I did want to, uh, I did reach out to Russians in Vilnius to see if they might participate. Uh, uh, but it, it ended up that nothing came of that, at least so far. So unfortunately, but st certainly that's important for me as well. Uh, Kirby, well, see, Ryan talked about sociology of addiction and uh, psychological illness. Uh, Islam also, like you said, how does violence happen? Uh, why do nations take up guns or not? Uh, Kirby, uh, could sociology uh, affect social change? So I think... Uh, what I'm looking for is, um, you know, is there something that we could maybe um, take um, or develop um, to make a study group meaningful, you know, in a practical sense? That's one thing. Uh, for Math for Wisdom, uh, this is meaningful in the sense that I'm trying to show the reality of a uh, language of wisdom, a language of cognitive frameworks. And I was very encouraged uh, when I spoke with Islam, and then we had the first uh, meeting that I recorded and published uh, talking about, let's say, the ways of figuring things out. So that uh, you saw the framework uh, that uh, Islam presented today with five different concepts, and it turns out that um, actually uh, there should be a sixth concept added, uh, vision should be added to those. Uh, and that would address uh, what Kirby talked about. So that in sociology, um, we have people like Gandhi or Tolstoy or Henry Ford, you know, or whoever it is, but they have a vision that they're able to somehow uh, get people to work around. Or even someone like Elon Musk, you know, has a vision and he's making the world change, you know, according to his vision. Of course, I want to do that, you know. Uh, so, and maybe uh, Brent is back. Uh, Brent uh, will be able to do that. Uh, Brent uh, is another person that I met in Islam met uh, at the Let Me Think Scholarship Workshop in Oneonta. So Good to see you, my friend. Yes. Brent, uh, is there a uh, thing All that right. you would like to... Uh, hi, good. To, is there something that you'd like to see us study re regarding sociology or that you would like to study with regard to sociology? There's like a tab open in the background. I don't know where it is.
I didn't understand you, Brent. I have in the background that's producing noise. Oh. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Yes. So the question again is, uh, what yeah, would okay. be of interest for you to study? So I'm, in I'm, I'm muting the, the speak. Trying to hear you, and I have a tab yes. open. So it's making another audio feed, and I don't want to broadcast that out. Maybe you can write in the chat if it's easier for you. So, oh, so I'll, I'll just give maybe one example. Uh, can I share my screen? Is that possible? Uh, of course, you should be able to. You're the co-host. Yes. Uh, so this is something that I worked, uh, I've worked out actually this maybe 15 years ago or 20 years ago. I want to show this slide. Um, uh, this was uh, at a conference. Uh, I learned about, uh, this was software engineering. And I learned, can you see this slide? It's a systems analysis in terms of uh, thinking. Can you see this slide that I'm showing? Yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So imagine I was at a conference on um, uh, basically diagrams for software engineering. And uh, what one of the people talked about was that there are different... Um, modeling uh, approaches and they surveyed the models and then i kind of made this diagram based on those six models how i would organize them but they're very much related to those uh five uh concepts in that book the social social theory of basic toolkit that uh, aslam uh, shared with us and so on the one hand you'll have an actor model so when you're doing a huge software project um you might want to think about uh all the users, you know, you express as use cases the roles and activities needed for the system to be useful. So you're looking at all the people involved, right? So that would be looking in terms of the individuals. But there's another way of looking at it. It says like the concept model. So express concepts as data structures that shape the system as data accumulates. So imagine you have this huge collection of data. It's organized in certain concepts. Uh, it's in these huge databases. You're not going to run away from that. That's going to affect, you know, how you work. So, it, it, you know, of course, that's data. But it, it's so this would be similar to the uh, constraints of the social structure that, you know, everything is set up. And then um, so these are these two poles. And then there's like four ways to connect them. And um, they basically in terms of possibility. So one is telling you what's impossible. So nature will tell you basically like what's impossible or, you know, what is the, and so the weather, for example, will force certain things or geography, like the, the river Nile says, you're going to have to deal with flooding, let's say, but the flooding will be, you know, give fertility. So in uh, software engineering, it's called technological feasibility. That certain things just are not gonna be possible technologically and certain things will be. But above that, there's another, so that's just like no, but there's another level that I call like not yes. So um, this is called the business rules model, saying that, well, certain things are legal or not legal, they're profitable or not profitable, or you know they, they fit within the normal flow of operations or they don't. So that's kind of like what we talk about with culture. Culture, uh, one way to talk about it is basically the world of assumptions, which especially includes the world of norms, but also the world of ideas and beliefs, etc. So those things seem very real as if they were natural, you know, and when you violate them, it turns out, but you can violate them. Now, if you violate them, uh, that can cause shock or trauma to people or disturb people because you're doing not according to the rules, right? So that has consequences, but you do have the possibility to uh, to do that. So culture is this like altern alternative to nature. It's a little bit softer, but still quite rigid. So this would be like not yes, I would say. Then the business process model is explaining, well, what are the processes that you would do to get different things done? So this would be like what we call action, that people can take certain actions. Okay, and so that's not no, like people do have a certain practical freedom to make choices, you know, maybe they did choose like not to, um, you know, they choose to not to drop out to say, well, we're going to try our family is going to try to keep you in school, 
someone took action there, right? And there's a way to do that. There's a whole bunch of processes to do that. So, and then finally for um, software engineering, you have this goal model. Like you try to say, well, what is the, you know, what is the logic to, I mean, what is the sense of all this? What is the purpose of all this? What is the vision of this? You know, what are we creating or what are we, you know, what are we having this huge software system for? What's the purpose it's functioning? So this is where you get to be imaginative and you can actually create new systems or you can try to repurpose old systems. And so this is missing in sociology, but I think that's why I would call it vision. And I think Islam kind of explained why they don't do vision because they don't want to have the responsibilities for normative, you know, basically for saying, well, this is how things are going to be, right? But the activists, so if you're the leader of the Pashtuns, this is exactly where you will be active. You know, you will figure out a vision for the Pashtuns. And so one question may be like, maybe the Turks, I mean, maybe the Kurds and maybe the um, Pashtuns have different uh, leaders with different visions, you see. Or maybe historically, they just have different visions that they're pursuing or not. Or like we know, like in Lithuania, once you have experience with a certain vision, we were independent between the two world wars. It was much more easy for us to fit with that existing vision and recover that and then become independent than for countries like um, Kazakhstan, which had never been independent in that way. Uh, you know, but once we became independent, you know, we made that vision concrete, then it became natural. Okay, they became independent too. So we have these types of things. So what I'm trying to say with this diagram is simply to say that uh, these are not accidental, the things Aslam talked about. This is real. You know, like the history of sociology shows that those five categories are real, but it could be more. Is there an internal structure between these? What is it? I'm trying to say, so there's a deeper reality um, that um, wondrous wisdom is all about. That's the point. And anything we could possibly do to uncover that uh, deeper reality and try to become practical about it would be uh, in the service of wondrous wisdom and, um, and including math for wisdom. So that's... So that's one reason why we're here. But the other reason is, okay, but as human beings, what would we like to do? You know, because it's very nice who showed up here. And uh, I think um, just to maybe to summarize, um, I don't know, oh, Brent, uh, Brent wrote some things in the chat. So let me just read them quickly. He said, uh, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that is... Uh, who can tell me who that's a quote from? That's uh, Kirby Kinsey. <laughs> it's uh, Buckminster Fuller. So this is a man of vision, as we were saying, someone who uh, had um, operated through vision. So just to repeat that, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Again, so this is not no or not yes or not no, it is yes, you know, create a new yes. And so I think that's what we'd like to do too, is like, what is a yes that we could create? Uh, certainly conflict resolution is uh, one thing. And then maybe um, that's hard because it's a huge group thing. And then a personal thing is the sociology of addiction, psychological illness, which is very interesting because it's not an individual problem, you know, which is, that's, uh, you know, again, like, we don't want to say that's just on the individual, but we want to understand how is it more than just the problem of the individual. So who has thoughts on how we might come together in some new way it, or, or some new ideas? I'd like to say I'm, I'm with uh, Ryan. I'm very interested these days in the problems of addiction. I've been spending hours recently studying the fentanyl problem, the mm -hmm. opioid crisis. It's really one of the biggest sociological issues around. Like I just have to go outside and start to encounter people with serious drug addictions. And I think it's related somehow to the school shooting addiction, this really weird pathology Mm -hmm. that's stronger in the states than i think anywhere else and what's that all about and the michael moore film bowling for columbine it did theorize at the kind of meta level higher than just the individual kids involved what is it about our culture 
that encourages this kind of alienation slash violence? I'm not going to answer that question. I just wanted to say, I think sociology is almost like we could look to it as needing to help us do medical interventions. I mean, we have an emergency and we need any discipline that has anything to offer to make those offers. So I, I'm going to be scanning the sociological literature for more about what's happening in sociology around these problems, school shootings and drug addiction. Other other thoughts? Uh, this is a good that's a good step. That's a really interesting, uh, I mean, and tragic, of course, um, reality that we're dealing with. I wanted to, Andres, uh, make a comment on Please. Uh, what you said, uh, the individual problem and trouble and then issues so which are bigger than the individual. For example, Wright Mill in the sociological imagination, he makes a very interesting distinction between troubles and issues. So troubles are mostly individualist, uh, individualistic or individual based. You know, the bus is late, the train is late. I mean, unless the train never comes, then it becomes an issue, right? <laughs> but but so so I think individuals at the societal level start to take action when troubles turn into issues, right? So like for example, drug addiction, uh, mm -hmm. the infantile and the psychological health, I mean, mental health issues, these are like issues. These are not just troubles. Yeah, like uh, the war, there's a war going on in Mexico, let's say, right? Exactly. And that affects, you know, tens of thousands of people killed because of our drug, uh, you know, problems in America. So that's an issue, you know, that's a huge issue. Right. So the mobilization is always when troubles become issues and then they become collective grievances rather than individual based grievances. And that is what creates uh, some sort of motivation for mobilization. And uh, I mean, I think the question of addiction and school shooting and it's uh, that's just I mean, school shooting, especially is just a very troubling question for me. It's and so maybe that's a good um, and what so that's a very I think a nice thing to think about is that cusp like how and you said it very well how do what what is it that by which individual troubles become social issues right and one thing I'd like to add to that is uh, dysfunctional values so for example um, I would like to continue <laughs> these. Uh, chaotic efforts uh, to help uh, Ukraine and Russia have a meaningful, fruitful peace. Um, but basically what I ran into was that it was impossible to find Russians wanting to work on this um, because I would say dysfunctional values, you know, that they're irresponsible and they're chauvinistic. And, and so... I think that that's these are huge value issues that are uh, coming up, and I don't. So there's two questions. Uh, one is just to try to understand that dysfunction, like where is it coming from? Uh, what's the what? What is that all about? But another is how to be able to overcome that and to be able to uh, reach people, you know, regardless. And I think that um, this idea of dysfunctional values, uh, it's not ob it's not certain, but it may be an issue in things like drug abuse, you know, that there's a, it may be one element. Now that may be more moralistic, but I think there's something must be to be said, you know, something's going on, like where uh, there's an individual responsibility also for, you know, what is happening. And now they're, it, it's not only on the individual, but it does, it does creep in through values, you know, that's which may be more, maybe not so much a cause, but sometimes a symptom, but but it's somehow in there. I don't know if the, if you, if people would agree with that uh, notion of, or what do you think, Ryan, about the role of values? I think that the, the notion of values is very important, especially when you... Um, have people, we have a natural tendency to seek out other people who have similar values. Mm -hmm. And uh, you come to a point of blindedness where 
people will reject what's good for them if they've been programmed uh, long enough to seek out what's not good for them and to cultivate that. You know, misery loves company, and it's not just misery. It's all the miserable things. They're epidemics. They seek to spread themselves. Uh, and it, you can... I hate to use this as kind of a logical fallacy, but it, there are slippery slopes you start in with just a small distortion of values, uh, sort of like a gateway. And then you get in deeper and deeper, become more polarized and, and whatnot. And, and I would just add that, like, one of the things I've done uh, organizing independent thinkers uh, was... Um, asking about their deepest values. I may have asked all of you, you know, what is your deepest value? And what's very interesting is, first of all, they're all very different. And it's a person's strong point, but it's also their weak point. It's often like related to their blind spot. So people have these blind spots. And ultimately, when you look at, when I look at all the mechanics of the wondrous wisdom and the whole, like, why are we here, et cetera, et cetera, it turns out like, um, Values are very much related to like our relationship to truth. They're very specific to like where we picture ourselves. And love is something, you know, they're like the aspect of love. Like if the spirit of love looked through us in the way that we, you know, saw ourselves with regard to truth and everything else. But they're very specific. And love is actually something uh, like this divine love is the spirit of love. Like it's bigger than that. So somehow like our even having a deepest value even being integrated but it somehow limits us and to be able to get beyond our own like limited sense of value which and again like like aslam mentioned the quran you know or whatever religion we might have like you know, we get hooked into some kind of thing that we're attached to and to say you know god is bigger than that right or whatever is this uh real spirit is bigger than what we're going to cling to value wise value is just um it's a tool, but it's not the end goal, you know. So somehow, um, I guess maybe to concur, like to try to figure what's going on with with values, what are their roles? Uh. Brent is writing, maybe I'll just read this. Uh, Out of context frustrations, uh, he's writing, uh, tribalism, not being open to new things, proprietary and secretive. Also, there are many people who are highly opinionated and will promote themselves, but not promote or see value in your perspective. Oh, maybe me, I don't know. Feedback look of stagnation that rewards the same kind of people and pushes others away. So, but I think like Ryan, and so this kind of goes with Ryan saying like, if we're into our own values and we only um, then look for people with similar values or somehow like compatibly dysfunctional values, you know, then we don't uh, see our blind spots. Whereas once you know yourself and you know your value, it's an opportunity to ask other people with different values, hey, how does it look to you? You know, so to live in terms of questions, not in terms of answers. Yeah. So we've been at it for about an hour and a half. This seems like we have a chance of a, would I would love to get together again in a couple of weeks if if somebody whoever would be interested. I know Islam will be interested. I hope. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the two of us. I would suggest. I mean, for the two of well, to mm -hmm. to all of us um, that because when you present it, so I'm uh, and today I spoke. Uh, my mind and I would like us to kind of put, you know, if there is a way to put these together or to like, for mm -hmm. example, I really like the vision, uh, you know, sort of edition mm -hmm. of yours because uh, that's like, I've never thought about even in my work, uh, the I've thought about the role of leadership and in mobilization and determining the direction of like movement in in the context of my research but vision is a very interesting sort of like addition to it so um i think i would like to work with you on expanding probably the model maybe comp like what i also mm -hmm. um like was when, when you said is there like a deeper reality that cuts through or connects all these different components, elements. 
So you know, one one thing one thing we could do maybe to be more sane and uh, more realistic, but uh, and just slower. And so why don't Aslam and I like why don't we meet in two weeks, and the two of us, right? And we'll work more on the theory and kind of like sort out, and then we'll have an a larger meeting in four weeks. Is that good? You know, so Which we would invite we everybody to join us in four weeks. Would that work with who would come in four weeks? Let's say because you know I don't want to. You know, we don't have to all become sociologists, but you would, Ryan would come, right? And yeah, you yeah. can all think about it. So the things that we would be preparing on, and we can also be exchanging letters um, in uh, in uh, the Math for Wisdom uh, email group. But um, one topic is vision. The other is trying to uh, relate this thing of individual troubles becoming social issues. And how does that, uh, like in the case of like, for example, addiction, psychological illness and and, uh, and mass shootings and things like that. But, and then maybe how the role of values would be. Is that question of values, would that be interested? Like, you know, is there such a thing as dysfunctional values or is that a moralistic way of looking at things? Is that helpful or not helpful? Is that a, that's something I would care about. Would, would anybody be interested in thinking about that? I think, that would interest me. It somewhat falls under what I think is a, a broad brushstroke megatrend in civilization is the medicalization of morality. Instead of saying, oh, this person's a sinner, they're going to go mm -hmm. to hell. It's like they have this mental illness and we need to help them cure it as we would cure a physical illness. And I right. think this is a different paradigm and it permeates the whole culture as to do we treat people as moral reprobates who need to be punished, or do we treat them as medical patients who need some some kind of therapy? These this tension between these two ways of treating issues in sociology is key for me. That is, I really like that. I think I would like to be part of that. And I, as as a secular humanist, I would like to. I, I don't think I need to state my position, but as medical patients who need treatment not you know but anyways yeah i i would love to be part of that yeah and then i, I think just to relate this back to ukraine and russia like this idea like uh can the national psyche be damaged you know can uh can people be damaged? i mean i think of like well, Black Americans have gone historically through so many things. And so the, in a certain sense, people are, you know, damaged in the sense that, well, what does that mean? But it means that, well, people will have troubles that um, they kind of put, you know, upon them or, you know, that they grew into or whatever. Uh, it's just it's just difficult. Or, for example, Jewish people, you know, when you go through so much anti-Semitism, I mean, the Jewish people have an enormously uh, fascinating and uh, and a fruitful culture, but I think anti-Semitism damages people. Uh, there may be ways that Islam damages people in a certain sense. Certainly, like in the Soviet Union, damaged a lot of people. You know, maybe capitalism damages people too. You know, it's just I mean, when you start to think of damage, like there's a lot of damage going on. We're just naturally damaged. So. Um, but so this idea of uh, and how does that relate to psychological illness? It's just maybe just one thing to add about that. Like, I uh, I had a friend. I have a friend. Uh, his son had uh, Tourette's syndrome. You know, so just symptoms like you know different tics or like chewing on your shirt or whatever, which really are not anything unhealthy about, but they're just socially unacceptable. And in order for the child to behave socially acceptably. The child had to be medicated, you see. And then there's this whole issue. Like, that's not the child's disease. That's like the society's disease, uh, that the society needs certain people to be medicated. Um, so I think that's kind of related to these topics. I'm also you, just to throw in one more thing. I'm interested, like you, you, Andreas, you have a lot of experience in what I'd call alternatives to violence, which in my Quaker tradition, there's an actual group called alternatives to violence, but there's like the concepts of mediation and even workshop exercises where you can bring groups together. But one of the questions I have in relation to that is sometimes I think 
that you can pick the wrong mediator, someone who's too invested or too biased or already too caught up in it doesn't make a good mediator. Like, yeah. I don't think that the U.S. has really any business trying to make things better, quote unquote, with North Korea because mm -hmm. they fought a war with North Korea. They always start mm -hmm. joking about how they eat all their cats and all this stuff. It's like you can't talk to your average American for more than two minutes before their hatred for North Korea comes out. And so I'm thinking Americans should not help solve that problem. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of the same feeling about Ukraine versus Russia. Don't ask the Lithuanians. They're the wrong people <laughs> yeah, to right. mediate in any Good point. way, you know? <laughs> So that's just part of the bigger dynamics of sociology. Who's an effective mediator? And it's not always the same person. It depends on what's going on, right? I think that is, that's a really, really great point. I've studied conflict resolution. My master's was in peace and conflict studies. And if you think, if you look at the these UN special envoys, a lot of these were I mean, the, to Syria was Algerian, to I think Libya was Spanish. It, it's just very interesting who they pick, um, you know, even the heads of the UN, right? Like, you know, I think there is a whole uh, calculation that goes into these positions. Like, are you, um, do you have any vested interests in the conflict? And so, yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a brilliant point. And so the question is, I think that's a completely agree, too much to be agreed. And so how can I, as a Lithuanian, you know, or my father, how can we reach out to other people to care to be mediators, you know, or to care to reach out, right? Like, what does it take to, how, do, how does that work? So maybe, uh, and then Brent, uh, I'm just reading his, he said something I wrote in a low moment. Oh, Brent. Knowing you are hated is better than being ignored. Because at least you know someone cares. <laughs> See, so that makes the Ukrainians feel better, probably right there, right? And then, the, but it's echoes from a digital isolation chamber sitting at home at a computer. So we love you. We care about you. We don't hate you, though, Brent. For, for <laughs> okay. So. Then the, in two weeks, uh, Islam and I will continue. Dude, we're just keeping it slow and kind of rational. In four yeah, weeks, yeah. maybe you'll be begging to join us. And then um, <laughs> who would uh, say a prayer for us? Maybe I ask my father if you would say some kind of concluding uh, blessing for us. You you know how to bless people. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm the best choice for that. But... Uh... Well, God, God willing, we hope to reach some useful conclusions, results, as we search further. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. So why would you encourage people to support Math for Wisdom as Patreon supporters? Um, well... Again, from my own point of view, it's these are important conversations for me that we're having.